glory. We're going to get started here. Thank you all for coming. You're good. It's my honor to be able to, to talk and to teach a little bit. And uh, you may want a, a Bible today. We're going to start a new series. Um, I never know exactly what we're going to do, but I guess we're going to start going through the book of Romans. And just teaching the simple gospel again. Because I'm convinced that whatever situation you're experiencing, wherever you're at with the Lord, that the gospel is the great theme. <laughs> it's the solution to every issue, literally every issue of the heart. So many times we're seeking God to do something and he'll just bring us back to the gospel again. <laughs> Lord, I'm having this trouble. I'm having this problem or, or I just want to see more of this or I'm learning about this and he'll just be like, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <laughs> You're like, whoa, thank you, Jesus. I really believe in it. And so I'm excited to go through uh, the book of Romans. Even today, we'll just start in the first chapter and you can see how it's obvious that Paul felt the same way. He was Paul was still pretty excited about the gospel, I think. <laughs> and uh, I love going through Paul's writings, you know, the epistles of Paul, because really, um, and uh, as you become familiar with the scriptures, you see that Paul was given probably the most unique revelation, um, probably the most powerful, the most... Uh, Ephesians 3 says it was hidden from the apostles and prophets for ages past. And actually, it kind of goes into that in this chapter too. It's like uh, in Romans 1 that we're reading today, that there was a gospel that was hidden or just that, that apostles and saints of old longed to look into for generations. And, uh, and, and it's revealed to Paul. It's like there's such a powerful and awesome... Uh, picture and so um, I'm excited to go through this book again and uh, and I just want to encourage you just to be open to like a new you know to something new that the Lord wants to show you because a lot of times we think that we've uh, kind of got a handle on it and so many of us have grown up you know oh we did the Romans road you know that's how we got saved or something or we or so we've experienced it but I really believe there's just a unique, you know, uh, just flavor of, you know, if, if you read Romans and it didn't make you completely ecstatic, you know, every chapter wasn't like just overflowing with joy and bliss and delight, then, you know, read it in anew, read it afresh, you know, there's so much goodness there, so, <laughs> but um, I just want to start, I wanted to read a, a prayer from a I was talking about St. Gregory of Nyssa, and uh, I've just kind of been reading some of his stuff. It's, real, it's really fun. He's a, he was just a wild mystic, you know, a church father. And I just want to read one of his prayers, and uh, I encourage you to find some of his stuff, you know, online, check it out, read some of his stuff. But um, in one of his letters, he, he opened it up. He said uh, he prayed this prayer. May the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who disposes all things in wisdom for the best, visit you by his own grace, comfort you by himself, working in you that which is well-pleasing to him, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that you may have healing of all tribulation and affliction, and advance toward all good, in the perfecting of the church for the edification of your souls to the praise of the glory of his name. Amen. <laughs> the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. My God. This is how our fathers have known him, you know. <laughs> the comfort zone of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's not always trying to stress you out and push you into some new place. Of course, he challenges you far beyond where you could ever go, but 
in the midst of that, there's such a sweet comfort. Like, like he's, he's got you wrapped like a blanket of glory, like a warm blanket of glory this morning. I'll just take a drink of that. Hallelujah. Shaka. Lord, we just love you. We love your presence in this place. We receive you. We just thank you for a spirit of revelation. <laughs> eyes to see today, Lord, new eyes. Just, whoa, just refresh, just clear, clean eyes today, God. I just thank you for the gift of purity, Lord, by which we see you. I thank you that we see you through such a childlike lens, Lord. Hmm. Such a refreshment, Lord. Like little kids coming each time to, to talk to our daddy. <laughs> Lord, I thank you that there's no jadedness in your kingdom, that we're not burdened down, that our spirits are free, that all unrighteousness is completely dealt with, is completely washed away right now. And even if there's any if there's any remnant of that in our minds and in our experience, Lord, right now, we just thank you for the cleansing work of your Holy Spirit in us. You are holy, Lord. You're holy. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> You're joyous, Lord. You're a good Father. So, so just speak to us through this and, uh, whoa. Yeah, amen. Amen. So, hey, open up the book of Romans if you got a Bible somewhere or something. Uh, we're just going to, I'll probably just go verse by verse. That's kind of like one of my things, you know, I like I like to teach. A lot of glory on teaching. Because there's a lot of things you can say to someone, but then if you actually say it with the scriptures, some people might actually listen to you, you know. <laughs> I think we're kind of, you know, especially since I speak mostly right now to, to people that are already Christians, they're like chapter and verse, brother. Well, we've done several uh, books of the Bible entirely showing you that God's intent that man would be inseparably united with himself in perfect bliss and union effortlessly. So we're going to go through another book. <laughs> and all these resources are online. So, you know, I get questions all the time. I'm like, well, I did like 20 videos on it. So there's, there's a good reference. But anyway, cool. Let me read it in the mirror Bible first, because that's a lot of times fresh for people. And then I'll probably teach through it in the ESV. But uh, the mirror Bible is an awesome translation. I'm just going to, we'll see how far I might read the whole chapter, but thank you, Jesus. Bam. While I'm teaching, you know, just engage the glory, just, you know, whatever. Just get whacked, enjoy, see visions, see angels. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 1. Paul, passionately engaged by Jesus Christ, identified in him to represent him. My mandate and message is to announce the goodness of God to mankind. Hallelujah. Hey, welcome. Shaka. This message is what the scriptures are all about. It remains the central prophetic theme and content of inspired writing. The Son of God has his natural lineage from the seed of David. However, his powerful resurrection from the dead by the Holy Spirit locates and confirms his being and sonship in God. Glory. We're in Romans 1, right? This is verse 5. The grace and commission we receive from him is to bring about a faith-inspired lifestyle in all the nations. His name is the claim on the human race. In Jesus Christ, you individually discover who you are. <laughs> in addressing you, I address all in Rome. I am convinced of God's love for you. He restored you to the harmony of your original design. You were made holy in Christ Jesus. No wonder then you are surnamed saints. His grace gift in Christ secures your total well-being. The Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is ours also, and he is our God. 
My greatest joy is to realize that your faith is announced throughout the entire world. The total cosmos is our audience. I'm totally engaged in my spirit in the gospel of God's Son, constantly including you in my prayers. God is my witness. Since I already feel so connected to you, I long to also see you face to face. I really look forward to finally meet you in person, knowing that my spiritual gift will benefit you greatly. It will cement and establish you in your faith. And so we will be mutually refreshed in participation and, re and reflection of our common faith. Until now, I've been prevented from coming to you, even though I have frequently desired to reap some harvest in you as much as I anticipate the full fruit of this gospel in all the nations. I'm so convinced of everyone's inclusion. I'm indebted both to the Greeks as well as those many foreigners whose languages we do not even understand. <laughs> I owe this message to everyone. It is not a matter of how literate and educated people are. The illiterate are equally included in the benefit of the good news. Because of this compelling urgency, I am so keen to preach to you Romans also. I have no shame about sharing the good news of Christ with anyone. The powerful rescuing act of God persuades both Jew and Gentile alike. Herein lies the secret of the power of the gospel. There is no good news in it until the righteousness of God is revealed. God now persuades everyone to believe what he knows to be true about them. The prophets wrote in advance about the fact that God believes that righteousness defines the life that he always had in mind for us. Righteousness by his faith gives meaning to life. Glory. The law revealed God's grievance from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness because mankind foolishly suppressed and concealed the truth in their unrighteousness. Even though God is not a stranger to anyone, for what can be known of God is already manifest in them. God is on display in creation. The very fabric of visible cosmos appeals to reason. It clearly bears witness to the ever-present sustaining power and intelligence of the invisible God leaving man without any valid excuse to ignore him. We're at, we're at Romans 121 now. We're going to finish the chapter. Bam. Yet man only knew him in a philosophical religious way from a distance and failed to give him credit as God. Their taking him for granted and lack of gratitude veiled him from them. They became absorbed in useless debates and discussions which further darkened their understanding about themselves. Their wise conclusion only proved folly. Their losing sight of God made them lose sight of who they really were. In their calculation, the image and likeness of God became reduced to a corrupted and distorted pattern of themselves. But suddenly, man has more in common with the creepy crawlies than with his original blueprint. <laughs> It seemed like God abandoned mankind to be swept along by the lusts of their own heart to abuse and defile themselves. Instead of embracing their maker as their true identity, they preferred the deception of a warped identity, religiously giving it their affection and devotion. By being confused about their maker, they became confused about themselves. Women became ensnared in passion for one another. Likewise, the men became inflamed with unnatural attraction to men. Even their personalities changed in consequence of their sexual perversity. And since they no longer honored or acknowledged God in their thoughts, they failed to see anything wrong with what they were doing. Sin snowballs. It spreads like cancer, exhibiting its ugly symptoms in every possible form, from perverse sexual obsession to every kind of atrocity. The problem with sin is that it never satisfies, leaving the victim miserably unfulfilled and constantly craving for more of the same deception. Vileness, jealous anger, obsessed only with self. Life is cheap, murder doesn't matter. They're steeped in constant quarreling and wickedness. Their conversation becomes reduced to slanderous gossip. No one is safe in their company. They think by insulting people they can voice their hatred for God, proudly bragging about their latest inventions of filth. Sadly, this all began at home where parents lost faith. Parents abandoned their own conscience and divorce became an easy out of their covenant agreement. Instead of cherishing one another with affection, they made their children the victims of merciless dilemma of divorce. 
It doesn't make any sense. They started out knowing the righteousness of God, yet by their deeds, they clearly preferred death. And it's almost as if sin became a fashionable contest. Here in ends chapter one. Kind of discouraging at the end there. <laughs> Jesus. But um, so we're, we're starting a new series on Romans. Welcome, guys, if you're just joining us. And uh, I like to read the whole thing, you know, just let it soak in. That was the mirror translation of Romans one. A lot of glory on it. A lot of a lot of weight. It's so beautiful. And uh, hallelujah. So I'm just going to kind of go through stuff verse by verse. So if you have a Bible, you can just open up to Romans 1. Or you can just soak in whatever. i got extra Bibles up here. I even got the 26 shooter still available. But uh, Jesus. But I love, I love Paul's writings. I just want to encourage us to fall in love with the epistles of Paul. Like, uh, you know, when you, when you get a, just a taste of this gospel... Um, you begin to see that really like the most clear revelation. It's not like any part of the Bible is better than others, but there are some that are more relevant to what God is speaking during this age of history. And the writings of Paul are just like the the juice of it. Like they're, man, they're they're just uh, they're you gotta you gotta like get it in you. You know you wanna you want to commune with this. And I know a lot of you grew up in the church reading it all the time, but. Oh my Jesus. So, here we go. Romans chapter 1. Um, Paul starts it out just kind of talking about, okay, uh, you know, I'm an apostle. I've been sent with this message. Um, in verse 2, he promised beforehand through his prophets in the scriptures. Like, he, he's declaring to you that this message that he's been given was literally for, like, such a time and a place as this. Um, it's not like uh, just some you know, new, like, you know, side issue, but really this was like kind of the central, like, issue that everything's been leading up to, you know, to be an apostle is one sent with like a, just, I mean, sent from heaven, and, uh, and Paul, you know, you know Paul's story, like, he's, he's had a radical transformation, and there's times, you know, like in Second Corinthians where it says he was literally taken up to the third heaven, and he saw inexpressible things, you know, uh, <laughs> There's one translation that, that kind of talks about those inexpressible things as if uh, it wasn't like so much that it, God stopped him from expressing it, but it was that there was so much glory on it that how is he going to put it into words? <laughs> some translations say it was unlawful for me to say, but some of them are, are more like I was unable to say anything like about this, which could have literally been why Paul went into the desert for like a decade, you know, or whatever. Some accounts, you know, say he went for a few years or some. But uh, he, he may have just been like so literally overwhelmed by this message that he like had to just go and just stand in awe of God for like for years. Just be like, oh, my God. Like, like literally when you start to get this, you're like, who's going to believe this anyways? Like, how am I going to say this to people? You know, like like uh, the real gospel, which is what we're declaring, that Jesus came to declare that the fullness of heaven is now available to man in this age. Like now, heaven to earth. Matthew 4, 17, Mark 1, 15, heaven is in this atmosphere of this room right now. <laughs> like we have some language for it a little bit now, but still it's like, my God, like the tangible expression of this, you know, it's been promised through the prophets of all the ages. And so, so what was this message? It was, it was the message of Jesus Christ concerning the son of God, verse three, Concerning the Son, descended from David according to the flesh, but declared to be the Son of God according to the power of the Spirit. So there he is. He's fully man, fully God, declared by the Spirit of holiness and his resurrection of the dead to be God and, and to be man. Whoa. God and man coming together, heaven expressed in the person of Jesus. <laughs> so the phrase in him starts to like take a new meaning, starts to have like weight to it. If you're found in him, you're, you're fully man and you're yet fully God. You're, you're united with the spirit of holiness and, and the power of the resurrection from the dead in Jesus Christ. Bam. <laughs> it's simple. You know, Paul, Paul, I, it's fun to start the epistles because Paul usually like just lays it right out in the beginning of each of his books. You know, like he gets right to the point and uh, like, you know, I love Ephesians 1. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 1. They're like, dude, you've got 
everything. You have it all. You have the fullness of the Godhead wrapped up inside of you. My God. <laughs> so verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. I'm just reading in the ESV now. Glory. So there was a supernatural grace. Like if you're called into ministry, there's no need to like try to make anything happen on your own because if you're really called into ministry, there's a supernatural grace and ascending from heaven. So it's effortless. It's not like, oh, how am I going to convince these people? He had a supernatural anointing to bring about the obedience of the faith. So he could just open his mouth and stuff would happen. There's a lot of weight on it. Yeah, you just show up. You just be yourself. And so Paul, you know, would say, like, I, I come in a lot of trembling if I were to think about myself in the natural, but, but I'm convinced of the power of God. That the, and, uh, and he goes on to say it in this one, too, that the gospel is the power of God. So he wasn't really concerned about his ministry, you know. I love that. There's just... Just, uh, just realize that Christian ministry is not your responsibility. <laughs> like whatever calling you have, you, you never had an ability to carry it out. But in him, you find resurrection power. You find supernatural grace. And, uh, and some of you may be called to be apostles. And if not, that's a lot of glory on you too. There's nothing better about being an apostle than anybody else. <laughs> In fact, the apostles were at the end of the train. They're the scum of the earth, and one, one verse said. So. <laughs> scum of the earth. Woo! Woo! Elvis is in the building. <laughs> Whoa. There's some juice on that. <laughs> So Paul is anointed with grace and apostleship to bring the obedience of the faith in all the nations, throughout all the nations. Wow, that would be intimidating if you thought you had to do it. Verse 6, including you. That's all of you. So there's an anointing that Paul had for you. <laughs> He's talking to the people at Rome, but he said all the nations as well. So. so that's why the Pauline epistles are still like, pretty much, you know, if you're just like trying to be like, what is this new covenant? Or just read the writings of Paul for a while and then filter the rest of the Bible through that. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have my permission to like parts of the Bible better than others for a, t for a time being anyways. <laughs> They're more relevant for this age. Verse 7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. So here he gets to his message, right? So, uh... <laughs> The first thing he says is grace to you and peace, my God. Grace and peace, not just a clever uh, hello, not just a clever greeting. You can extend grace. You can speak it. You can, you can proclaim it to another person. You can release the shalom of God over somebody because that's what they have. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ washing over you like warm waves of glory. That's my translation. Verse 8. First of all, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. So he's talking to people already that had faith. Hallelujah. There's faith on the earth. Amen. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that, that Paul prayed a lot for these people, always in my prayers, asking that by God's will, I want to, he wanted to hang out with them. He wanted to see him in person. He, there was a significant period of time where Paul was not with the Romans, and uh, he did end up there eventually by one way or another <laughs> because he wanted to see them. He said, verse 11, that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, right? So uh, there is such thing as impartation. <laughs> I'm just going verse by verse randomly, right? So here we are. Impartation. We're talking about you have the fullness of the Godhead. And obviously, I think Paul had a little bit of an understanding of that. And yet, there's still something that happens when you, you can lay hands on somebody and you can release to them something. Like, you know, like, that's, that's crazy, right? Like, our, our, our rational minds may not understand it. And, uh, but I love it. I love impartation right now, you know. Um, 
I think uh, obviously the main focus is just, you know, getting the gospel, just getting the message. But then, dude, like there's an activation that comes. I, I just encourage you guys to like be to have a faith for the laying of hands, to have faith for like being able to your presence like releases things and you have unique things. You know, when you hang out with people in the body of Christ, like you have stuff like and uh, so Paul's like, I want to hang out with you, not just because I'm an apostle or that was part of it. But like he's like, I have stuff like to give you, you know, <laughs> I have stuff, dude. Say the word stuff. <laughs> I have stuff to give you. Glory. Yeah. And verse 12, that, we, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So you can, you can give things just by the fact that you believe in Jesus can affect the people around you. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've often intended to come and hang out with you. But this far I've been prevented that I may be reap some harvest among you as well as the rest of the Gentiles. So he was like traveling all around everywhere, bearing fruit in his apostolic effortless calling. Verse 14, but I'm under obligation both to Gre Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. And I'm e but I'm eager to preach the gospel both to you who uh, also to you who are in Rome. Why? And this is like my favorite one, dude. I, all right, we're in verse 16, okay? I love this verse. And when you get a hold of it, it's like more than just, you know, something you put on the back of like your track team's t-shirt. Or whatever, you know. It's not just like a clever verse that you put somewhere. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. Why? Because in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So good. Paul was gripped. Why? Because he'd seen what this simple gospel can do, you know, just telling someone that heaven has come to earth and the person of Jesus and that they're included in the fullness of God. They're included in heaven right now. That will mess with somebody. <laughs> it does stuff to people. Just, just letting them know. You know, I encourage you in your boldness in it, you know, just like you may feel, you know, that, and that's why Paul is like, you know, I could have came in my own weakness, you know, like I would be trembling if I thought I had to convince you of something or I thought I had to change you. Like, it's so good just having zero pressure to try to have to change somebody. But what he said was, I'm excited to come because I know if I just simply speak of this simple message, like stuff happens, not just stuff but salvation, the fullness of all the restoration and redemption can happen in your life, can manifest in your life just by, bam. That's why like people are like, you know, wow, I'm really going through this problem or like I have this issue. I usually, I just direct them back to the same old thing over and over again. <laughs> and I can tell sometimes people like, they're like, really? You know, like, like really? Come on. <laughs> but yet, if it is the very power of God, like what's going to solve your, your issue, you know? What's going to bring th you through this? What's going to take you to whatever like thing you're, you're wanting or needing in your life, dude? It's the power of God. But where's the power of God rest? Not in like worshiping it up. Not in like, you know, pressing in for it. It lies in the message of the gospel. It lies in the truth that he already communicated. He already finished in the person of Jesus. And it, why? Verse 17. Dude, this, this is really the, the, I mean, the crux of this chapter, dude. Romans 1, 17. Because in it, in this message, the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of man, not like what you need to do to get right with God. Listen, getting right with God is like an Old Testament concept. Like, nobody needs to get right with God. <laughs> In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, or other ones, from faith to faith. What does that mean? That, this is good because for, from faith to faith, that can sound like, oh, like a mysterious concept. It means he already had faith, and in this message, it communicates his faith, which gives you faith. Like knowing that he had faith in you, knowing that he already accomplished it, and just hearing that gives you the faith. So you're like, well, I don't have a lot of faith, or I'm weak in faith. Listen, this gospel declares to you the reality that he already believed in you. And when you hear that, it will, it will cause you to believe in him. 
Like even just speaking this, that's why like I keep coming back to it over and over again. It's like we can do so many things, but but since there's such a lack of like teaching in the gospel, I just I, I just want to teach it over and over again because hearing it, even just hearing it one time, could cause you to get the faith of you know, of God, you know, or the faith of Smith Wigglesworth, or the faith of John G. Lake, or the faith of Mother Teresa, or uh, the faith of Jesus is given. It's all included in the message of the gospel that's why i'm not ashamed of it i love to say everywhere i love to speak of it i love to like i want even a, a clear picture of it you know i'm like i want i want my like telescope to get clear my magnifying glass or whatever you know my revelation my eyes to get clear of this of this pure gospel like i want to encourage you i know i still know you know people that are like well you know that's matt's message or you know, that's somebody's message or like, I don't want to just say what everyone else is saying. Listen, just like, if it's true, just, just say it, just believe it. If it's truth, it's truth. You know, it's like it either heaven came to earth or it didn't, but if it did, it's pretty good news for everybody. <laughs> and you don't need to come up with like a new way to say it. You know, I mean, of course you're going to have your individual expression, but like, don't feel like you need to, well, I want to come up with my own ministry. Listen, like, <laughs> whoa, I don't care about my ministry. I don't care about whatever. I just like to tell people that they're included in heaven right now. <laughs> because in it, in this, the righteousness of God, listen, the whole world is focused on the righteousness of man. And that's the difference between what Jesus preached and every religion of the world. It's that every religion is preaching, how is the righteousness of man going to be accomplished? And even that's the focus. Every time you have an issue, like, how am I going to solve this? How, is, how am I going to figure it out? How, and in the gospel, it's that God figured it out for you. <laughs> I mean, have a drink. Come on. My God. The gospel is God figured it all out for you. <laughs> you can you can just be a child you can be this is where this glory comes from it's ridiculous now because all that's left to do is celebrate all that's left to do is enjoy he believe he listen it's like we all know well salvation is is you know by grace through faith so then most people are like well the only thing left to do then is for you to believe no this verse says that he believed for you my god so wait what is the deal here so what's my part nothing 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 you're good you got it you're already there you're all you're, the saints were home before they started whoa seriously there's a lot of stuff talk about pilgrimage and stuff in the Bible but that's all in the Old Testament the New Testament is you're in the promised land Jesus read Hebrews 8 read Hebrews 10 Jeremiah 31 the very thing of the new covenant You've already arrived. You're here. Jesus. It never gets old to me. My God, just make, just let Paul's message be your message. Let Jesus' message be yours. Shaka. So literally the rest of this book is just laying out that. It's just, he goes on a, what is it, 16 chapter journey through the fullness of this gospel. So it gives you a deep, you know, description, but you can, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to like walk through every single chapter and get this complicated thing because it's all, it really is all laid out here. Verse 17 is pretty much the summary, I think, of the book of Romans. The righteousness of God revealed from faith. Oh my God, I just got to read multiple translations. I just got to read it. Jesus. Oh Lord, hallelujah. The Dewey Reams Bible, for the justice of God is revealed therein, from faith unto faith. See, it's like the phrase glory to glory. A lot of times we think that's talking about progressive growth, but I don't believe it is. I believe glory to glory means he was glorious and he re releases from his glory to your glory because Christ is in you now. So there's virtue flowing like a channel. It's not about uh, tomorrow I'm going to have more glory. I mean, that is, there is a truth to that. But if you read the passage, I think it's in uh, 2 Corinthians, it sort of says glory to glory. It's talking about from his glory to your glory. It's a channel. There's, a, there's an open pathway now. In fact, he's not up there. He's in you. That's why it's a portal. It's like a channel. And the same with this, from faith to faith. 
It's not like your faith grows tomorrow. It's talking about his faith imparts to you into your faith. Your faith was weak. It wasn't even a mustard seed. That's why no one moved a mountain. <laughs> Jesus is the only one that moved a mountain. But now in him, all mountains can be moved. In fact, they are. Okay, the Good News Bible. The gospel reveals how God put people right with himself. My God. It is through faith from beginning to end. As the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. Whoa, I'm just going to keep reading it. <laughs> you guys are so good. Just drink it. Just drink it. <laughs> the good speed New Testament. In it, God's way of uprightness is disclosed from faith and for faith. Just as the scripture says, the upright will have life because of faith. The Moffat Bible. God's righteousness is revealed in it by faith and for faith. As it is written, now by faith shall the righteous live. The old King James. Therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The Lexham English Bible. For the righteousness of God is revealed in it from faith to faith, just as it is written, but the one who is righteous by faith will live. Here, here's a cool one. The message. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what Scripture has said all along. The person in right standing by, before God by trusting Him really lives. Woo! <laughs> okay, here's the mirror, right? One of my favorites. <laughs> just get this. Really, you gotta you just just buy the Mirror Bible. Just everybody buy it. It's scandalous. People think it's too much of a paraphrase or that it's like got its own bias. But it does have a bias. It has the bias of the gospel. He's very free in his translation. But but uh, Francois is a, a scholar, and the more I've studied each verse, I'm like blown away by how much he, he's really faithful to the intent of the text. But anyway, glory Romans 1.17. Herein lies the secret of the power of the gospel. There is no good news in it until the righteousness of God is revealed. The good news is the fact that the cross of Christ was a success. <laughs> God rescued the life of our design. He redeemed our innocence. Man would never again be judged righteous or unrighteous by his own ability to obey. It is not about what man must or must not do, but about what Jesus has done. God now persuades everyone to believe what he knows to be true about them. From faith to faith. The prophets wrote in advance about the fact that God believes that righteousness defines the life that he always had in mind for us. So good. Righteousness by his, God's faith, gives excuse me, meaning to life. Not man's good or bad behavior or circumstances interpreted as a blessing or curse. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Look away from the law of works to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of faith. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you, Lord. It's so good. It's just good to soak in, in this. You know what I mean? These scriptures will like come up in your subconscious. Start showing up in your dreams. <laughs> The New Jerusalem Bible. In it is revealed the saving justice of God, a justice based on faith and addressed to faith. As it says in scripture, anyone who is upright through faith will live. Hallelujah. Let's see what else we got. So many translations in my e-sword. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All right. So, it's not your righteousness, <laughs> but you are righteous. <laughs> You're filled and flooded now with a supernatural righteousness that does not stem or originate from yourself. The day you believe that is the day that you can call it, you know, you're born again, or, or you can call it just your, you were filled with the Holy Spirit, or whatever experience you want to call it. The moment that you believe, that righteousness will begin to flow from you like a river, and now you'd have to work to stop it. <laughs> that, that is really the good news of the gospel. Because what he's saying is righteousness will or the righteous will live by faith. Through this faith, you find the true life that, the, you know, the, only through holiness will you actually be able to enjoy your life, basically. Right? Because you were created for holiness. That's why people are like, 
I don't like holiness. Well, maybe you had a wrong definition of holiness, or maybe you saw a God, you know, a God that was just judging people and always talking about holier than thou. But true holiness is, is just being able to function the way that God intended for you to function. Wholeness, shalom. The New Agers may have a better description of it for you. Health and wellness. Yeah, it's to be set apart from God for, for God. That's so a lot of people are like, well, I know the word holy means to be set apart. Yeah, but that, I, I don't like that definition to be honest. Like it doesn't really, it, it's partial, but it's like almost, well, yeah, I'm like, that means like I'm, I'm not here, I'm somewhere else, or I don't know. It doesn't have a lot of glory on it, I think. I think holiness is just all the attributes of God in your original design, like being able to, to play out in a healthy way, you know, shalom. The, the wholeness. Hol holiness is true wholeness, purity. Yeah, it's being set apart from everything bad. <laughs> but still involved in the world and very much present, you know. Very much present even with with sinners, with, you know, it's not, it's not being, you know, you get what I'm saying. Glory. Because they're so quiet. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. All right, I'm going to get into the, the fun stuff here, the end of Romans 1, <laughs> where it talks about the wrath, the wrath of God. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your wrath. Hallelujah. The very first thing it says about wrath is that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness. Whoa, the wrath of God wasn't against you. It was against ungodliness and unrighteousness. God hates stuff. We never hated man. There's actually complete mistranslations of the Bible where you go through it, like in the Psalms where it says, like, God is angry with the wicked every day. Have you ever heard that verse? It's like Psalm 7 or something. But if you look in, like, the, all the accurate translations, uh, the word, like, with the wicked is, like, in italics. It's mean they didn't know what he was saying he was angry with, so they, they, they actually inserted their own words there. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? God is angry with the wicked every day, so that they put with the wicked there. Of course, God, God hates, what, what does God hate? Ungodliness and unrighteousness. Whoa. But he actually likes people. <laughs> Even the wicked. <laughs> Otherwise, he never would have sent Jesus, right? Whoa. It's so crazy how we've just gotten stuff twisted, you know, or whatever. But Jesus. But there are, there are a lot of consequences, and it begins to talk about here what happened, all right, and, the, and, and what happens in ungodliness and unrighteousness. Because we're not just going to pretend that, like, you know, okay, Jesus preached the gospel, and now everybody's perfect, so you can just live in ungodliness and unrighteousness, and there's no consequences. No. No, it's funny because God, it's like the sin issue is dealt with from, from, from all perspectives. So it's not that now, you know, there's no wrath left because he absor he, Jesus absorbed all the wrath, right? There's no wrath. That's why people say, well, oh, there's a calamity that happened this week, you know. God's judging America or something. Listen, if God wanted to judge America, dude, it would be, you wouldn't even be here. But the cross absorbed all wrath. That's why I can't ever receive negative prophecies anymore. I can't even hear it. It's like a clanging gong. It's irrelevant because of what Jesus did on the cross. But sin still has an effect on people. And that's why, you know, it's, he's not just overlooking it. And that, you know, that's the significant difference between what's being preached so, so widely in America and all over is that so much of the church says we're all forgiven but not changed really you know like Jesus' work was enough to forgive you but not to change you but in that case this world is really going to suck because people are going to keep hurting each other and destroying each other but god's vision was for the kingdom of god on earth that means perfection that means perfection that means utopia eden restored in fact even greater than eden the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven is completely free from ungodliness and unrighteousness. And so we believe that Jesus actually accomplished something on the cross. Jesus.
Jesus. So by, so what happened though? By their ungodliness, they suppressed the truth. And this is really interesting to see where this goes here. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his in invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So everyone's without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. So, <laughs> he's describing the fall of mankind here, right? What's so interesting is to see that the fall of man happened inside the mind of man. Whoa. <laughs> These ideas that God like withdrew his presence or that, you know, because of sin, God left the earth or something, right? That's not our father. He never left. What happened was we in our minds exchanged this very view of God, which is what's happened. People think that God is a, a, is a father that abandons us, you know, or God is a father that gets so upset that he can't hang out with us anymore. You know, he has anger problems. He has, you know, he, that's why so many people are upset with God in the world. They're like, well, well, I feel like I could be a better father than God is. There's people that definitely think that, you know. And they'd be right by the view that we've often portrayed, you know? <laughs> the view of our Father that we've revealed. But what, what happened was we exchanged how beautiful and how perfect of a Father He is. We exchanged His glory in our own minds for something so much less. That's what happened in the fall. We said, because that's what sin does to you. This is why like, people are like, well, don't. I, I still, you know, when I have a relationship with someone and they're in a sin, I still want to talk to them and be like, look, I, I love you so much and I'm not going to just like pretend that nothing's going on. I want to help you. Why? Because what sin will do to you is it makes your view of God completely different. You begin to believe things about God. You begin to believe that God is an angry, like, you know, revengeful, like, jerk. Because, you know, you begin to think that he's like, you, have, you just begin to get twisted in your revelation. That's what sin does to your own mind. That's why God hates it so much. That's where arguments go. And that's where we want to argue with God, you know. That's where we get, look, here's one, I just feel glory on saying this, right? Getting mad at God just shows that you're not in a place of revelation. Now, people are like, well, I get mad at God all the time and it's okay. I'm not saying that it's not okay, but it, but obviously he's probably right. <laughs> now it's okay like to express your emotions to him and say, look, I'm genuinely like, this is how I, you know, well, this is just what I'm feeling, Lord, and I'm going to express it. But in reality, a lot of times that, that anger with God comes because we've exchanged his goodness for a different picture. You know what I'm saying? You're like, well, God doesn't have something good for me. God! Why don't you have something really, really good for me right now? I'm mad at you. Well, it's, I mean, he died on the cross, you know? <laughs> he shed his blood, you know? He spilled his blood for you. Do you think that he doesn't have something good in this little circumstance you're dealing with? He doesn't have something ex ex exceedingly abundantly above. But that's what happens when you begin to entertain issues of uh, sin issues or whatever in your life you will begin to get a view of God like for example here's another another view like well God's called me to do something like he's sending me to Siberia I hate Siberia but he's sending me there because well you know don't don't say Lord there's only one thing I don't want to do or that's the thing he's gonna make you do no that's not our father but we exchange this view of him you know he created you for an, ex an abundant life and he's going to call you to the things that he created you for it's like he's not you're not going to take a hammer and use it as a jet ski or something you know <laughs> you're not going to like you're not going to use a chair as a ladder or i don't know you know what i mean you 
he when he created you he's gonna position you in a place that functions with your glory see I'm just like hitting on little you know lies that maybe we believe in the church but there's all kinds of twisted pictures that sin gave us about God and we exchange this glory of a beautiful God that has ecstasy beyond your wildest dreams like ecstasies like Paul was like I was caught up in an inexpressible ecstasy Psalm 1611 as right hand are joys forevermore pleasures pleasures forevermore he put you in a garden called Eden called pleasure and we think that he created us and put us in this crappy like world of sin where everybody's gonna hurt one another and you got to live like well if anything maybe there'll be a life good after I die all these lies that we believe because we've exchanged the, the beauty of who he is for what it says is image built after man but that's what the fall of Adam does but the restoration of your purity in Christ when you just receive his free gift of righteousness just acknowledge what he did for you begin to feel that purity flow through you you're gonna see a God that's so good <laughs> You're going to see a God that's so good that you'll be absolutely intoxicated out of your mind. The line between madness and mysticism is a thin one. <laughs> True Christian mystics that encounter the glory of God look like madmen because of what they see and the beauty of what everything is. But so much of the church is still living just in this simple Romans 1 realm. Why? Because we refuse to, re to receive his perfection imparted in us. And if you're going to walk in unrighteousness, you're going to see God as unrighteous. You're going to see yourself as unrighteous. You're going to see the world as unrighteous. And everything's going to suck. And your only hope is that maybe someone will give you a promise for something good after you die. Wow. There's a lot of glory. So they exchange this, and, the, and here's the thing, if you, if you want to insist on your exchange for the glory of God, for the ima image of man, you want to hold on to your own image of what God is like, and worship idols, or worship man, or worship your idol of what you think God is like, then God will allow you to do that. He, in verse 26, for this reason God gives them over to dishonorable passions, because that's the fruit of you believing the negative things about him and about his, what he's created. And then the women exchange natural relations for those contrary to nature. Men give up natural relations with women, consume with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. It's why? Because they did not see fit to acknowledge God. Not acknowledge God as who he is and the glory of his goodness. Because if you don't see him as a good father, does all kinds of twisted things to your inside God gave them to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done they're filled with all manners of unrighteousness evil covetousness and malice it's the downward spiral acknowledging his righteousness given to you as a gift is a continual upward spiral but exchanging the image will be a continual downward spiral and if you see your life in any sort of downward spiral just return to Verse 16, 17, the power of God and the gospel. Just let him speak to you again of who he is, of what he's done for you. The message of Jesus Christ. I really believe in it. You guys believe in it? <laughs> Do you still believe in it? Do you... Oh my God. I've seen it transform emotions, you know? Like people have problems in their emotions. I'm telling you, you can live in emotional stability. You, you can have... You can literally have depression-free life. You can have, you can live in a life where you, you're, you're, you just, there's true health. There's healing. There's healed. There's perfect healing. But the downward spiral leads to, to all these things. Envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliceness, gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, Ugh. gross. Though they knew God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve death, they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. Why? Because that point, when you, once you've exchanged things, it's like, why do, why, it's like, why would people become a Satan worshiper? You know what I mean? Why would anyone who's thinking clearly be like, I want to worship someone who like, 
you know, where you just cut things open, you know, you just drink blood and you talk about hatred and all that. It's that it's a downward spiral. You get because you can get to a place in your thinking, literally your mind becomes somehow that makes sense to you. Somehow there's people where it really makes sense to them. You know what I mean? And uh, whoa. It's it <laughs> and it's since so many things. But at that point, there's nothing you can do, and that's an extreme example, but when someone's caught in any one of these things, even if you just call it gossip, you know, we think, well, that's like a mild one, right? But in any of those things, you can't, you can't help them by addressing the issue. You help them by speaking to them of this gospel, which is the power of God. You just, you speak, you begin to speak of this, and the solution will begin to manifest. That's why, like, we're hanging out with all kinds of people, you know, I got homosexual friends or, or whatever, like, you know, People that are drunks, gamblers, drug dealers, druggies, whatever. I love these people. And there's no need to like bring up, you know, and address all of those things. Those are, there's just symptoms going on. You know, they're just, they're just like whatever. And, and, uh, and they're all just as pure as you are. <laughs> but when you speak of this gospel, that purity will manifest. But I'm not ashamed to say that there are things that are unhealthy as well. Like, I'm like a happy gospel preacher, right? But I'm also not going to be like, sure, you know, killing people is cool. It's good, you know, awesome. You know, like, <laughs> there are some things here you're like, whoa, you know, like, Paul's just naming it all out. Let's just not focus on the sin. I don't want to focus on the sin. I just, I, I just speak the gospel, but I also, like, want to say there are healthy lifestyles, you know? Like, getting drunk on alcohol isn't healthy, you know? Like, there's these, I mean... Homosexuality isn't a healthy lifestyle. It's not. I love you enough to say it. I'm not going to talk about it that much because there's not a lot of glory on it. But I also want people to know, like, okay, we're in a reformation, you know, a revolution of whatever, you know, the gospel. We're talking about every man's purity. They're all pure, but let's not, you know, get stuck in just uh, validating unhealthy lifestyles, you know. There's so much purity, dude. There's so much glory. Because I know that that when you when you're walking in the purity that that this Bible talks about, you're gonna feel so much better about yourself and everyone around you. And you'll be able to to help the world. That's the revolution, you know, that it's like how how are we going to change the world, you know, or whatever? I want to see so many good things happen in the world. Listen, stop dealing with the outward things. Like, like I'll just, just be honest on this, like, little, this, you know, well, it's kind of, it's definitely a major tragedy that happened in our nation. But all these people want to respond by coming up with outward solutions. And I, and I tell you, like, in all, you know, in all humility and compassion, that the solution is in a grassroots move of the gospel because it has to happen from the inside out. Like these guys, you know, people are like, well, let's make stricter laws. Yeah, like that works. It's, that's always worked, right? But not to be rude about it at all, but I genuinely, we, whoa, this message of Christ needs to go out, the pure message, the pure message. And there's no pressure to try to make it happen because when you begin to speak it, though, the people around you get it. I'm not ashamed of this message because I believe it can really bring emotional transformation to people's lives. Whoa. I believe. I mean, just sitting here with a dozen people and speaking of it, like we don't need to organize some campaign to like save the nations. You just, I speak to you. If I really have revelation, you're going to share it with everybody you know and it's going to go forth. It just does. Grassroots revolutions are the only ones that really work. <laughs> just people sharing with friends, word of mouth, you know, as much of an ad campaign that you can form for the gospel. It's always word of mouth that really, you know, stuff just happens. If it's good, it's like a good movie. You don't need to convince your friends to go and see it. You know what I mean? If it's really good, they're going to, they're going to get it. They're going to go there. You're gonna, you know, you can't keep them away. If it's a good band, it's like you, you don't, you can promote their music well all you want, but if they're really good, they're gonna do. They're gonna make it. You know what I mean? Of course, there's a few little things about music promotion and all those little, you know, whatever. But dude, I believe in a grassroots message. So just you know, don't be don't be ashamed. You know, I, I'm just gonna bring it to a close. But <laughs> don't be ashamed of the gospel. Just share. 
you know, get, get a clear revelation of it yourself where you know. I mean, when you know, you know. You, like... <laughs> I, th I think Jesus said it the best in, in Matthew 4, 17, Mark 1, 15. If you want the central little verses, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The fullness of heaven has been brought to you in the person of Jesus Christ. Heaven now. Welcome to heaven. You're in heaven. Today, not just someday far off after you die. You're in. You've been included in the Godhead. I guarantee that as you manifest that, as you speak that, lives will change everywhere you go it's either riot or revival they're either going to hate it they right and i believe they can only hate it for so long or they're going to love it and it's going to transform their life otherwise we might as well just throw everything we believe out if this gospel isn't powerful enough in and of itself we might as well burn our bibles and give up because i've tried my own efforts <laughs> i need something that works you know I need something that's real. And I believe the nature of reality is revealed in who Jesus is and what he's done. So. Amen. Is that good? You guys are good. My God. Shaka. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's just pray a second. Yeah. Just look to Jesus right now. Lord. Hmm. We like you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you redeemed us from the exchange of your image for lower things. But you're revealing to us such an exalted beauty of yourself. My God. Woo! You are the pure, childlike, ecstatic, holy, healthy Lord. You are the, you are the glorious one, the, the magnificent one, Lord. And you've made us as your masterpieces, Lord. You're, you're the perfect artist, Lord, and you've made us your masterpiece. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for this gospel. I thank you for the power of it right now, renewing minds, just the quickening right now of minds. I thank you, Lord. <laughs> I thank you beyond what any man could do, but you came as the God-man, and you fulfilled. You, you believed for us, Lord. We find ourselves in your faith right now, enwrapped, enveloped in your person right now. We're flowing through the veins of God. And you're flowing through our veins right now. I think you're every place you've positioned us, Lord, in the world. That you're not calling us to some like place that doesn't fit us, Lord. But you're, po you're positioning people right now exactly where they're meant to be because they're in you. They're in you, Lord. Just as Jesus only did what the, he saw the Father doing, we can only do. I thank you that we're possessed, Lord, that you're leading us by desire to only do what you're doing. To only be where you're being, Lord. To be consumed. To be, to be captivated, Lord. To be captivated. And I thank you that this message frees us. Lord, I thank you not just the words, but Lord, you, the word, the tangible. The tangible spirit of God, the person of Jesus flowing, frees us. You are freedom, Lord. You are freedom. You're absolute freedom right now. Right now, Lord, if there's any unhealthy lifestyle, we don't condemn anything. We don't condemn. It's not even about right and wrong, Lord, but I thank you that you are freeing hearts, Lord, that you have freed us, God. And we sing songs, Lord. I thank you for songs going forth from this room, songs of life, not songs of lack, but songs of wholeness. That you're, oh, God, you've given us something to sing about, God. You've given us something to live for, not just something to die for, but, Lord, we get to live in you. Ha, ha, ha. Shaka. In Jesus' name. So I'm going to leave some music on. You can soak if you want. Fellowship, whatever. Hallelujah. Have fun. You guys are... It's my honor to just share with you a little bit. Um, if you want to give, we, we do have a giving basket back there. My wife and I are doing this full time. We also have other expenses and stuff. If you want to sow into the ministry, you just want to give unto the Lord. Um, you can make checks out to the Firehouse Projects, or give by cash. There's also credit, debit card things back there. Um, if, you're, if you're watching online, you can uh, think, think there's a little link. You can give. So, thank you, Lord.
Amen.